David Wayne. Hi. <laughs> David Wayne, one of the original members of the state, one of the creators of Stella. A graduate of high school. A graduate of a high school, former magician. Current magician. Current. <laughs> Holy shit, that was bad. Um, <laughs> director of Wet Hot American Summer, which I think is perhaps what you are uh, maybe known for best as it has become a huge cult hit. Uh, also the director of the Ten, director of Role Models, director of Wanderlust, uh, one of the creators of Children's Hospital on Adult Swim, one of the creators of Wainy Days on the internet. I'm tired. Um, you must be. Uh, but let's go back and let's 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 figure out where this all started. Uh, what? Where did it all start? Did it start with being a magician? I mean, do you think that's how you became a storyteller? I, I was obsessed with being a magician as a kid. I was. Uh, I loved Doug Henning. Um, was a hero. But um, I also, without thinking of it in those terms, was really interested in comedy. I, I loved Steve Martin and I loved Woody Allen because my sisters were older and they, they had boyfriends, that, one in particular, who brought home records and VHS or beta tapes of Woody Allen. And so your sisters and, dated comedy nerds? Well, this one guy. This right. is really this one dude. Um, who I then, much later in life, reconnected with and, and was part of my early career, actually. This, oh, really? This guy who was, his name is John Bendis, and he was, uh, um, he was old, you know, quite a bit older than me, and he was, I was nine and he was 26 when I first became buddies with Really? Him. Uh, Do you know what his impression of you was at nine? I think he thought I was funny. I think he was charmed by my goofy. Did you know you were funny at nine? I think I tried to be funny. I, 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 I was, yes. I was the class clown in my family. Right. And it was a goofball. And was that part of you? Was part of your uh, doing magic, though, storytelling and telling jokes and, and taking people on a journey, or was it, I just want to be great at magic? I certainly, if it was, I didn't think of it in those terms. I just was like, I want to be the best magician in the world. Right. People would say, what are you going to do? And go, I'm going to be the best magician in the world. I know what that means, but I just, I liked doing magic tricks. And, and when did it turn the corner? When did it go from, I'm going to be the best magician to, I'm going to, I'm going to tell stories? Well, the, the magic went out the window when I realized that it wasn't interesting to girls. <laughs> <laughs> um, so somewhere around... Is it hard to pick up women with magic? Well, I think it's changed now. This was pre-Blaine. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, because Blaine is, is yeah. like... Uh, it, was, it was the time when... He's like a sex figure. It was Harry Blackstone and David Copperfield with the big... And, uh, and, and, and Doug Henning. And so, uh, but, in fact, one of the magic teachers I studied with as a kid said at about 12 or 13 you're going to give it up and i was like no i'm not and i did <laughs> really um pretty much i mean i was really into it i went to magic camp and i was i was very obsessed but i have since sort of picked it up again in my 40s right you've shown me tricks recently yeah, i got really impressed fairly me. serious about it and even better than when i showed you oh really but uh <laughs> maybe for all really nice uh, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> so you went to Tish. Did you go to Tish knowing I want to be a director? Or did you go to Tish thinking I just want to? Yeah, I know I want to work somehow in the arts, and I don't know where. I went to Tish really honestly because I knew I wanted to be in New York. Um, I went to NYU because I my father had been born in New York. I, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and I'd been to New York a few times. It just seemed like oh my god, this is where I want to be. And um, I also associated it with Woody Allen and with Saturday Night Live and mm -hmm. the Muppets, and I just somehow was like, I that's of course, I, I got to be in New York, and so I basically went to NYU for that reason. And I had been doing a lot of since I was ten. I'd been shooting stuff on video with my friends, and sketches and skits and little shorts, and so were you editing them at, in high school? Uh, I did some editing because that's a huge deal for people our age. I mean, I think uh, yeah. for them. Editing is literally something they can do on their iPhone now. Right, there was no computers. Right. Um, when I started doing video editing, it was on you know two decks yeah. together with a controller. Sometimes not with a controller. Sometimes it literally just play record on pause. one, record on the other, pause, you know, rewind to the next start. Okay, unpause the recorder, you know, and it was very glitchy. It required an earnest desire to edit something together. It, yes. Well, a lot, a lot of things I did that were in-camera edits, mm -hmm. or they would be. Uh, I had th this video tape system I had, which was basically uh, a VHS recorder and then a power supply, which was the size of the recorder. They were both <laughs> this big, you know, and extremely heavy. And then the camera was separate. Yeah. And then the um, there was a thing called video insert, and mm -hmm. so you could shoot, say, 
me lip syncing to a song. Right. And you could insert video over where it only recorded o a video over it, but not audio. So there was this was like an incredible thing. So oh. I could shoot me lip syncing to a song, and then when I like switch places, I cover that part over. Like I would switch locations in camera as the song was going, and huh. I would cover that over with some other artsy shot that I would do. I, I was just looking at something I had done when I was ten. Really? So you have all this stuff? You have a catalog? A lot of it I still it. have. I digitized a bunch of it at one point, which I'm glad I did because most of the VHS tapes now just are deteriorated. Or you can play them once, and then you can see the plastic coming off it. Oh, here. really? Yeah. It's so really all sad. my early videos that I did here at Harvard. And I'm older than you. Like it's even just a few years. It's amazing how. You know, it, I, I wonder what it would be like if I grew up today, because it's so different. The, what's available, the, the means of production are so much more available, and so many more people are doing it. I don't know if I would have gotten well, lost or overwhelmed. I think that's, yeah. uh, and you're taking advantage of that, and we're going to get to that in a moment. But let's, uh, Sorry. I want to, uh, no, not at all. I mean, it's, 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 it's fun to talk to you about this, because, uh, and to talk to you about it in front of kind of students who are making films right now in high school, because... Uh, you have taken so many different routes, and you are you are taking advantage of all the same things they are, um, even though it's later on. It is later. On it's it's late. I mean, it's it's, it's a fair it's amount my, later. My um, <laughs> you need all the members of the state now. For those who don't know the state, um, the state was the coolest fucking show on the planet. In is this nineteen ninety five? Nineteen ninety four? Ninety three to ninety five. Ninety three to ninety five. So uh, David and a bunch of members, they, all you went to Tisch, right? That's where you we guys all met? met the freshman year at Tisch. And they put together a comedy troupe that was on MTV for a season or two seasons. It was, well, it was basically about under 30 episodes. It was the, it literally was the coolest comedy on earth. And the show was going to move to network. Right. And then it didn't happen. Right. And then there was a diaspora and everyone went into uh, different directions. Except that we've kept working together in different, smaller configurations for the decades hence. Right. So, the show Reno 911 is a result of the state. All of David's movies with these actors, which so it's, you know seem to pop up in all this different stuff, that is a result of the state. Uh, Stella, uh, which was on Comedy Central, which you know came from this live show that David does with two other really funny actors, Michael Showater and and um, uh, Ken Marino. Um, is uh, comes from the state. What was that like when that happened? At Did you time, feel like yeah you were part of something? I knew that yeah I I saw these. I actually joined. The state started because I was at NYU in a sketch comedy troupe there, and then one person left that group to start like a B team JV squad, and that was what became the state. Oh, interesting. Um, because we didn't want to have new members in our senior group, which, <laughs> um, which actually disbanded as soon as this, the junior group did their first show because they were so incredible. Wow. And. Um, yeah, I just as soon as I saw any of these, met met and saw all of those guys, I was like, wow, this is incredible. I mean, I had no frame of reference being a freshman in college, but I still was like, these are the most talented, funniest people I've ever met, and to this day, I still say it, you know, and I still work with them as much as possible, as many as possible, all the time because they are incredible. And it, it has been an amazing thing that this college sketch group, we were eleven of us, um, more than three quarters of us have directed feature films, and mm -hmm. you know, we've all stayed in the business and kept making a living doing it. It's very, it's good. And you were, and you were acting in it, you were writing on it, and you were directing on it. Right. Uh, and we, it was very uh, guerrillas. We, I, we were editing and doing camera and sound and props, locations, you know. What's your favorite sketch of yours from the state? Mm, well, there were, uh, one that comes to mind is one called um, Taco Man. Oh, I was hoping you were going to say Taco <laughs> Man. <laughs> That's one of my favorites. You have to YouTube. This sketch, it's. Can, can I give him a. a, like a, a Listen, uh, it's your night. Baby. Uh, <laughs> this is more about me. Uh, no, no. Can you tell them about Taco Man? Taco Man is a. Uh, um, so basically, it's. I don't know if it bears being described, but uh, a man comes out uh, to talk to the mailman and complains that there's tacos in the mailbox every day instead of his mail. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> the mailman's a little defensive about it, and he says... He's hurt. He's hurt, and he's like, yes, that is what I'm doing. I put the tacos in your mail, but uh, they're good tacos. And, I mean, we just got to see it. And, he, <laughs> well, and, he, and I remember he goes into it, he, and he's very earnest about it. He says, look, these mailbags were just not built for carrying tacos. Right. Uh, 
And uh, the guy says, well, if, if I had a choice of getting my mail or, or the, the tacos, tacos, I think I need to get my mail right? <laughs> for bills and like, things if I like want a that. Taco, if I want a taco, I can go to Taco Bell. And he's like, you're not going to eat that. <laughs> it's like the, the tacos are your good tacos. I mean, they're the best tacos I've ever had, but that's not the point. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> the, the mailman walks away. Uh, the man's wife, who's actually a guy in drag, comes hey. over. Oh, it's you in drag, comes over and sits in the car. <laughs> and you say, Honey, who is that? <laughs> and he says, I just had the longest conversation I've ever had. Right. And then the mailbox starts to walk away, and you both go, Goodbye, mailbox. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that my favorite sketch? I don't know, but <laughs> I remember. But I remember seeing it, and it's really funny because there's so much nonsensical comedy that exists in the world today because of Adult Swim and because of all the different YouTube channels that it almost seems normal now. But in '94, whenever you did that, I remember seeing that and like my mind broke in half because I knew how funny it was, and I could not tell you why. And that's something that seems to be part of all of your work, which, you know, well, yeah. I, I do think that what we were doing, which I, so much of it I wasn't as conscious of at the time as I am now, but part of why that worked that way was because we got into a situation at MTV where there was nobody telling us really what to do. Right. And we didn't, we weren't coming out of UCB or Groundlings or Second City. We were, <coughs> we were basically teaching each other everything. We had. We loved some of the same things. We liked Monty Python, SCTV, sort of. But it was truly a bunch of people who just found each other funny and sort of figuring it out together. And the the bubble we sort of were in, I think, informed the comedy a little bit. And it didn't seem like we weren't thinking, we're breaking ground all the time. We just right. thought, like, this is awesome. We're doing our thing. We get to do this, and this is fun. And, and um, so, and we definitely had a cocksure attitude that served us at the time and you know the, the executives at MTV would say well we don't know if all of you can be on screen and we don't know if this is you know we'll have to talk about what kind of show you guys are going to do and we were like fuck you you know, <laughs> like, you know we're going to do it our way or showed up your ass <laughs> which you know I don't know that I would advise a young group of 21 year olds to say that oh you should they're TV here network. you should tell them that <laughs> um, um, but it worked at the time at you know MTV was very young itself and right you know, Especially in terms of doing production, how uh, how does What Hot American Summer? How many of you seen What Hot American Summer? Just show of hands. The ones who have not raised it, you have to go see this movie. It'll immediately become one of your favorite comedies, along with Juno. Yeah, they've seen Juno. <laughs> Trust me. Uh, so, what? <laughs> the dickest thing I could possibly say. Uh, so. Um, uh, how, did how, that does, how does the state come to uh, lead to Wet on American Summer? Well, the state sort of dissolved in the late in the mid late nineties because we sort of made a dumb move and tried to tried to go to network and it was the wrong idea and blah blah blah. And there's a there's a whole story behind that. Um, but basically, um, then we were all again in different configurations trying to figure out what to do. And Michael mm -hmm. Showalter and I just started writing some stuff. We actually wrote a high school movie that we were going to do and, and we, it was complicated and hard and we didn't know how to do it and the, you know it was I'd never written a screenplay before and we didn't really even finish that script and so we thought let's just do something a lot easier and quicker um, that we can just shoot this coming summer this was in spring right um, so we'll just like throw together like an outline and get our friends together and go out in the country and do a summer camp thing you know and just be, it'll just be funny and so we outlined a bunch of stories just from our own memories of summer camp, basically. Like, what if there was a chef that did this? And what if that, right. You know, and, my, and real stories from our camp. And we just basically said, here's 10 storylines with 10 characters, and let's just do that. And then as we were writing it, though, we were like, well, let's write it out a little more. And then, and then we started to realize it was more of a full screenplay. And then as we started to try to go out and get people to invest money in it, that took three years. And so... <laughs> During those three years, we kept rewriting and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. Right. So by the time we actually were lucky enough to have a tiny budget and get to a location to shoot the film, we it had gotten pretty tight, at least for our taste, you know, that, the script. And um, and then we got to shoot it. <laughs> and a lot of the other actors that like everybody here knows, uh, who really came out of your movie, were these just friends of yours? Like, no. This is an introduction well, to Amy Poehler. This is right. an introduction to Bradley Cooper. This is an introduction to Paul Rudd. 
uh, his introduction to apparently Paul Rudd is a comedian because people only knew Paul Rudd as this like real like a dramatist. He was like a Broadway theater guy who did drama and it was turned right. into a comedian with that movie. He was most famous at the time for Object of My Affection and Cider House Rules. Ha! <laughs> right. Um, and uh, Elizabeth Banks was her first job. Right, Elizabeth Banks. Molly Shannon. Yeah. Uh, Gene Garofalo was in it. It was a, um, the answer to your question. It was a combination. Some of those people we knew from the New York comedy scene, like Janine Garofalo. Right. Others uh, we didn't know at all. Bradley Cooper and Elizabeth Banks, and you know, just walked in off the street, auditioned. For no the film. kidding. Um, and then others were people like Amy Poehler, who we knew ish, but you know, we were we asked to do it, and uh, people like David Hyde Pierce and Molly Shannon were actually stars at the time, and we we off made offers. And <laughs> so it was a combination. But even. Uh, Chris Maloney had come in and auditioned, even though he had already been on a, a few things. And it was uh, that sort of mixed match cast happened to everybody at Gel, and it was we were all out on location at this camp, and shooting for no budget, sleeping in the bunks, um, eating the camp food. And what was your hope for that film? I was honestly excited to, to the goal for me was to finish it and have its day in court, which meant that it would open in one theater. Wow. Um, and so the fact that it actually opened in two theaters when it opened it was <laughs> you amazing. Doubled. To me. Truly. Yeah. I mean, I really was so happy. And the one theater it opened in New York was like at the 42nd Street, there's like a 29 plex, and it was at the top screen. Like, you had to go up 18 escalators. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know what you're talking so about. So there's like a room that's much smaller than this room. Right. With like a little TV screen in it, and that's like theater. Where you, when you get there, you think it's a trick. Yeah, it's like the servants' quarters theater, right? but um, so, but it, you know, it but you, before that you played Sundance with it. We went to it was an interesting thing, and I met you at Sundance that that your your short was playing. Yeah, side note, yeah, my short film opened for Wet Hot American Summer at Sundance. Yes, and then we partied together. We did, which was amazing for me because I was twenty one years old, and I was already a like as you can tell, I'm just like a ridiculous fan of David and the state and the whole thing. And I was hanging with all these guys, and I was just, I was waiting for them to, like, kick me out. Like, no, they realized I, I was 31 years old, and I'm like, wow, 21-year-old, cool. Like, <laughs> <laughs> got cool chats with him. I don't remember that <laughs> happening that way. Um, but uh, we went to Sundance, and Sundance was, like, a big deal. It was, like, every screening was sold out, and it was, like, a revival concert. Everyone was, like, loving and laughing and having a great time. But we got no bites for selling it for, or for distribution. Um, none. Like, not even a lowball offer from a crappy place. Nothing. And months and months later, um, USA Films made, they were like, oh, it's still available? Really? <laughs> huh. Oh, how about this, like, like insultingly ridiculous <laughs> offer where we'll pay you nothing and give you no share of profits and we'll barely release it. And we're like, yes! <laughs> Happily, we're going to sign. And that's basically what we did. you know. And they and they sort of petered it out. They, they dumped it in a couple theaters and then it did okay enough to ultimately play, I think in like, sort of over the course of the summer and the fall, right around 9-11 basically. Mm -hmm. It was... Um, I, th I don't know. Maybe played sixteen cities. I mean, it was a it was a non nothing theatrical. When did it pick up speed? When did people become aware of that film and, it, and start to? I don't think it even began in the slightest bit till maybe a year and a half to two years later. And I think it was when people just word of mouth, very slowly, the DVD started going around and people started being like, "Hey, this is a weird movie. What was this?" Is this know? also like with each of the actors becoming famous? There's this kind of oh, what was this movie that? Well, Amy Poehler was in, Bradley Cooper yeah, was in. All that probably happened a little bit even later than that. Like, you know, in, in recent years now, people are like, what's Bradley Cooper and Amy Poehler? And, and then I feel like last this past summer, it screened far more than it did the first when it was the actual What kind of screenings did you have last summer? Um, I didn't have any myself, but like, no, no, there, no, there's, the movie, yeah. they have, in many cities, they have these big outdoor screenings in parks, and, they, and the movies, like, have, they have uh, midnight movies and mm -hmm. Austin Draft House plays it and right. all those sort of like cool alt cinemas around the country have a midnight screening at least once during every summer. How exciting is that? I mean, I mean, I'm uh, like uh, sincerely I think that to feel like you have something that's now part of this pop culture that doesn't belong to you anymore. Uh, it's it's amazing. I I can't even describe it honestly, and I, and it was not part of my expectations or even my dreams for it. I mean. At best, I was hoping it would come out and people would like it, and then that's they move on, you know. And mm -hmm. 
people have stayed, it's got a very small but very devoted, obsessed following, and that's incredible. I just, and people, I'm not in the movie, but people come up to me and recognize me as, the, almost, as the director of it. It's, it's uh, you know, not something you can count on or plan for, it's, it's cool. So let's talk about role models now, your first studio film, uh, for a second. And I'm curious about, because what, what I find really interesting about you as a storyteller, I think, you know, I've done this a few times, I've brought other directors, and I, I like to talk to directors about finding your voice. I think that's kind of the most important thing. And for those, how many of you are actually, like, aspiring writers or directors or, like, that's somewhere? Good. Five of you. Um, uh, Five is the best number. Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I, frankly, for no matter what you do in life, I think there's a moment that happens where you discover your voice um, where you stop trying to imitate the people that you think you're supposed to sound like in whatever profession it is, but particularly in ours. And, and it's the moment that you, you stop <coughs> judging your voice and you accept it and you start to kind of work through it that uh, things really begin to happen. And you have such a unique, identifiable voice, particularly in the world of comedy. What happened when you went to make your first studio film? Well, I just want to comment on what you're saying. I feel like I had the great, amazing gift of having that voice, um, you know, validated by the being part of that sketch group where we all, interesting, you know, really embraced each other's voice, and we we were. By the time my dream was always to be on Saturday Night Live, mm -hmm. and by the time I was a sophomore in college, I didn't have that dream anymore because I was wow. like, "Wow, we're doing the state. That's what we're doing," you know. And I was like, "That that's us. That's our thing. That's bad. Do my thing," you know. And I've always done that, for better or worse. And I probably would be a lot richer man if I did something else. But I just sort of said, I'm doing my thing, whether it's nothing or big or small. And so I've always just sort of tried to just listen to myself. But anyway, so the answer is, so, we, so then Role Models was this bigger project that I came into. Um, a director had left, and it was not so far before shooting. And there was this very messy, crazy script that was not good. And um, It was a, it was another interesting um, opportunity where it, there wasn't a lot to lose because I don't think anyone was expecting much out of it or something and I just said I might as well do what I do which is trust my own voice and in this case it was me and Ken Marino and Paul Rudd together all just you know spending day and night um, you know killing ourselves with a very strict time limit to try to sort of start over with this script and turn it into something that we liked that we were excited about mm -hmm. and but using the structure that was there um, that was good and what and using knowing that we're trying to make a studio comedy that I mean, not not trying to who's the studio was it universal yeah and did you feel their presence, though? I mean, how different was that from making the 10 and from making Wet oh, it was totally Wet different. Hot. I mean, so, somehow I, during both the 10 and Wet Hot, I had gotten into a, a situation where there were an investor company that had nothing creative to say about the movie. And right. so I was absolutely on my own, like 100%, me and my partners, you know, whether it was with Michael Showalter with Wet Hot and Ken Marino with the 10. And with this, it was, it was a studio film. We had, I had a very, very strong producer, Mary Parent, who was there every step of the way, pushing, pushing, pushing for yeah. certain things. I had a studio that she was actually a good buffer for, but that was also, you know, but I actually, we had a, ultimately a really good experience. They pushed us hard to, and we did more, and we did better, and we like, we had to defend our choices. And right. I had, I would in total consider that a good experience. Then later was Scott Stuber, who was the producer, and it was, um, it was a totally different animal in that way. I mean, the actual making of it and the figuring out the comedy and the edit, editing was kind of the same thing, but that developing and finding it, it was a lot more defending the voice um, and saying, I think, like, and, and it was layering in a voice into a more mainstream show. And it's interesting, because you've actually now also found actors who have kind of worked their way into, they are a particular type of actor when they work with you. So like Paul Rudd, for example, your Paul Rudd is much different from Apatow Paul Rudd. Yeah. Is that a discussion? Is that a conversation between the two of you, or is that just a, an understanding of how the two of you work? I certainly, it's certainly not a conversation. I think uh, I, I've been somehow so you've made wonder lost to them as well. Five movies, you have an indie thing. I've done five that, movies uh, and they've all started Paul Rudd. <laughs> right. Um, which is not wasn't the plan. Wow, that's true. Yeah. I mean, he wasn't the main star. I mean, Wet Hot was an ensemble, and so was the Ten. 
but he has been um, in all five. You were the Nicole Hall Center to his uh, Catholic care. Uh, that, that would be um, <laughs> the greatest compliment you could ever get. <laughs> uh, I, I just am a huge fan of her. But uh, so, no, I just honestly, whether it's subconscious or not, every pod time a movie is getting developed in my head, I'm like, well, I know it's the same thing, but really, Paul would be the best guy for this part. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he's been good enough to, to, to come on board. And, and he and gets your universe. I mean, that's kind well, of the yeah. cool thing, is that he gets, because uh, in your movie, a, a scene can be legitimately dramatic, and then it can immediately be mock dramatic. Right. And then something literally insane can happen. Well, part of why he and I bonded, I think, he, I met him because he saw this play that we had written called Sex Wieners and Boots in the late <laughs> And he just, it was crazy off the wall absurd. Right. And he just ate it up. Like he, and, I, and, and we definitely, like, have obscure, you know, I, I say things that are so purposely so stupid, like so banal and not funny, and, you know, a whole room is there and he's the one who's laughing. You know? Right. So you know that there's like some appreciation back and forth that's... Right. But he's got this incredible ability of, of being a truly legitimate, grounded, deeply feeling leading man right. and also understanding all the weird, layered absurdity that, that can be in a, and how to how to make that happen instinctually. He's, he's, you know, when you work with an actor a lot over multiple movies, as you have you, too, you, you just get to truly appreciate just what a staggeringly difficult art, art form that is and how right. rare it is for someone to have both the inborn talent and the developed skill that, that a great actor has. Right. What, uh, let's talk a, a little bit about, uh, I'm going to talk about Wayne Days, I want to talk about uh, Adult Swim. Uh, let's talk about Children's Hospital and where <laughs> that came from. Children's Hospital is a, um, a series on Adult Swim that we're in our fifth season uh, now that's airing right now on Thursday nights on Adult Swim. and. Uh, the idea came from Rob Corddry, uh, who um, basically, it was during the writer's strike, and he had taken his child to the children's hospital and thought there was something darkly funny about the, just the idea of a children's hospital. Right. <laughs> um, because everything's small there. And, <laughs> and uh, but he, he basically, he had a one-line idea for the show, which is like, it's a children's hospital, but funny, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> just, but, but like our kind of goofy whatever. And right. So, he and Cordry got gets you as well. Cordry's kind I think of so. he Cordry's belongs to the same. A little same younger level. too, and he he I think was aware of the status. And he we had worked together on the ten. Oh, that's right. That. Yeah, yeah. And we had also worked on the ten with the uh, my producer John Stern, and the three of us basically partnered up together to develop and figure out Children's Hospital. And and it was a web series at first during the writer's strike, and it was just going to be a ten episode, ten five minute episodes. Thing. As something to do during a strike. As something to do just during for a strike. Fun. Literally, exactly that. Literally, just for kicks. And, but he brought in this amazing cast of people that he had worked with on other things before that. Um, and Aaron Hayes and Megan Mullally and Lake mm -hmm. Bell and Ken Marino. And it was it was a, an incredible group that only was committing to one week of shooting. Um, but then it got picked up by Adult Swim as a as a legitimate TV series, and the the whole cast stayed with it, and we added in. Molly Ackerman, and it was, um, uh, and now it's in its fifth season, and we've won the Emmy two years in a row, and it's just been like this incredible experience. How is your and how is your approach different on that for making movies, or is it different at all? The process is totally different in, in some ways because well, we sh we shoot in four day blocks where we just shoot two episodes every four days. Um, wow, it's twenty eight days to shoot a full season of fourteen episodes. Wow, um, and there's no slap time, there's no extra, there's no pickup, you know, and. Right. Uh, so it's just a lot of very fast, clever, outside the box, which I kind of really love, you know, solving those problems of like, how are we going to fit on the page all of this story into 11 minutes and then into the two days of shooting, how are we going to fit all of these scenes in? And um, just constantly bringing in really funny actors and, you know, the three of us monitoring the tone and the, the quality of it. And, and you have to know exactly what you're going to shoot, too. Of course. Yeah. There's no time to dick around and be like, oh, maybe it could be like this. No. Um, there, in fact, Wet Hot American Summer and the 10, all of the things that I've done on the lower budget have had the least amount of, they look a lot more improvised than they are because we just don't have time to sit around and be like, wouldn't it be funny if, or like, let's just riff, you know? And right. Which I say that sounding derogatory. I, I think there's an enormous value for improv as a tool in any part of making a movie sometimes, but sometimes you just don't have time. And 
Wainy Days. Wainy Days, uh, web series um, also that... Uh, you basically aren't doing enough, <laughs> and you feel like, what am I going to do with these few minutes that I still have to spare? It did come up at a time when I was getting pretty busy, because I was just starting Role Models, basically, and this mm -hmm. guy in a web, uh, starting a website, My Damn Channel, and he said, what if I just gave you money to do whatever you want every week on a web series? Mm -hmm. And this was what was fairly early in the right. web series idea. And I was like, okay. And, and I, the first time I had really done something without specifically a partner. And it was just like, what's my life about? And I thought, oh, my life's about chasing girls. And so um, I just had thought, well, each episode is about a different woman that I'm trying to meet and right. generally screwed up with. And, and, and just naturally, my where I'm writing it, it just gets a little nutty and absurd. And so um, they, we've done almost 40 episodes of that. And do you shoot and cut that all on your own at home? No. Uh, no. So, many of them actually were, some of them are scripted by other people, some of them were directed by other people. Um, a lot of them I write, a lot of them I direct, and then I have editors that do a pass, and then I usually then sort of craft it. Got it. On, on my, by myself. Is there anything that you do right now where if you are literally you're cutting on your home computer? Yeah, well, in fact, this feature that I'm finishing right now that I shot last summer, um, the editor uh, is off onto her next project, and so I sort of took over, and I've been, um, I did a very, like, major pass on it uh, in my house. And you're on Final Cut Pro? Actually, on the I'm, I'm on my laptop. Got it. Because it was in, it started on the other. I mean, is that a thrill for you, or is that uh, I love it. You love it? I love it. Because it gets, every year it gets a little easier and a little faster, and, you know, just the technology. And the fact that I really can genuinely just sit on my couch and be editing my feature film is pretty cool. Yeah, it's insane. And it, but it's great. But it's I, I don't feel any limitation at all. I mean, that's, everything's right there. Yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, let's open it up. You guys have any uh, have any questions for David? If not, I can keep on talking. Right? I can also answer questions not about the film business or anything. It's also awesome magic. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can I can answer questions about squash. <laughs> um, panting. Can we magic? Uh, that would work. Let me think about it while you. While if somebody else has a question, maybe. Back filming. Any advice on getting into Tish? <laughs> hmm. Will you write a letter? Drop my name. <laughs> Just tell them I'm a really good friends, dude. <laughs> <laughs> We've hung out. Um, you know, honestly, I mean, I I applied there in 1987. So, um, on paper, yeah. Talk to Leslie behind the desk. Uh, if she, I think she might still be there. Um, no, I, I, what I do know is that when I applied, it was a totally different deal there. The, I think all you needed was a B average and an average SAT score, and that was it to get into film school. No one they didn't expect anyone to have the ability to make a movie, to make anything uh, on film, and so that it would be an unfair to expect that because very few people had access to anything. Now it's totally different and it's just screwed up. That's, I mean, the big dramatic change though. Uh, when I look at young filmmakers now, what's extraordinary about them is that they are learning to make movies the way you and I would have learned to draw or play guitar or something that we would have access to literally from day one of our lives. Right. By the time they get to college, they have already tried shooting a bunch of stuff, they have tried editing a bunch of stuff. Oh, yeah. Their level of sophistication when it comes to how to edit things together and how to cut to music and what a good and shot is. And how to is. do visual effects and how to do right. s so many things. I mean, it, it, I, I, I'm so glad in many ways I didn't have that stuff because I think I would have been overwhelmed. Intimidated, and, and yeah. Like, needed a lot of Adderall or something. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, and I remember, I mean, around the time we met, I was making one short film a year. And that seemed like crazy when I would tell people I make a short film every year. I was like, whoa. And now, um, and it's like one a week. Yeah, I mean, one a week. Why not? I right. Mean, what What's holding you back? But your shorts were pretty <laughs> high tech and cool too. I mean, they were really good. They I mean, let's be honest. You could tell I worked a year on them. You were doing a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> no, I spent fourteen months making my short in college. Right. Yeah, and it was. It, I used every bit of it. And it was a lot of chasing trims around the edit room, you know, on film, and it was crazy. My yeah. avid spit out the um, key numbers wrong, and oh, I had to God. redo them by hand. And my negative cutter was this like little old lady who had like worked on like the original King Kong, and her hands shook, and she held the scissors, and it was just terrifying. So many times on the state, I would edit all day, 
and then we would go to the online session all night. And it, the online session was just a redundant process of okay. matching the edit you did to the actual right, source right, right. tape. And it's like, oh god, I'm just, I just don't have the energy anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, do you prefer writing alone or with a partner? <coughs> and what do you feel of the advantages? I've done both. I've mostly written with partners or groups over the years, but I've, I've started more recently sort of building my confidence and, and writing more things by myself, which I really enjoy. And it's a totally different thing. I, it's almost like apples and oranges in some ways. Um, obviously, the, the constant sounding board, especially in doing something comedic, is great. And so you, you, know, you can get pulled back from going too far down the rabbit hole, or you can for me, it's also been working with a partner is a great discipline thing. It's like we're writing at 3 o'clock, both have to be there. Right. You know, and one person starts to get distracted, the other person goes, come on, let's, come on, let's, let's stick with it. So that's helpful. But I think as your muscle grows, you, you don't need external discipline as much. Um, but, uh, you know, a good writing partnership is always more the idea is you're creating something that's more than the sum of the two parts. And, um, you hear Alexander Payne and Jim Taylor, right? How? Oh. They have two keyboards attached to the same computer. Oh, that's great. So literally one could be writing something, and the other one could be deleting <laughs> the words well, simultaneously. Well, that's, that's essentially what Google Docs is, too. Is that in real time? Yeah, it is. I'm not, like, I'm I've not done even that. aware. I've actually done that with uh, some partners where you're, we're writing outlines, especially, and I'll be like, no, no, no. no. And then instead of commenting, just erasing and changing. <laughs> <laughs> but if anyone's read Tom Lennon's book, another guy from the state, and yeah. Ben Garant, they write, um, they outline a movie and then just take each other, every other scene and then email to each other and then rewrite each other's scene without commenting or talking about it. Right. And the, the, the notes are just, here's how I rewrote it. And that's actually how I just did a I just did my first collaboration with another writer and that's what we did. We did we took a book, yeah. we split it into four quarters. She did the first and third, I did the second and fourth. See? And then we rewrote each other's, we stitched them together, we realized that we forgot chapter five. <laughs> so I adapted chapter five, slugged it in, and that was the script. I bet it's awesome. Oh yeah. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> we'll no, see. I think I think that's I think that's really cool, and I I've, I've never done exactly that, but I I think that's a really interesting, cool way to, to do it, and it's especially, it's interesting to not have the long like, well, here's what I think, and just be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just rewrite it the way I would do it, and then you can see where it lands. Right. You know? um, but I've tried a million different ways with with both with the technology process of it and with, you know, who the partner is and how you write and right. You know, there, I think every project sometimes has a different need, and, you know, there's certainly no hard and fast rule. It's a very curious group. I did such a thorough interview that I know, left well. literally no stone unturned. All right, so let's see what we can do. All right, let's see. Yeah, give us what they, 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 they. Right, I know why, you have cards on This is why they came. <laughs> this is why they came, for God's sake. I don't know why they came. So here's some Dance. <laughs> Just my my uh, my uh, audience wants what it wants. Um, <laughs> can everyone see? Okay, so this is what Ace of uh, Ace of Diamonds, right? So Ace of Diamonds, right? So um, if I have the Ace of Diamonds right here, right? And then uh, I wonder if this will work. Okay, so this card is Ace of Ace of Hearts. If I were to switch them out, right? then I've stolen the Ace of Diamonds and switched it with the Ace of Hearts. But the question is, could I, could I do it in such a way that's so fast that, like, do you see me make the switch? Did you see, like, does it look like I'm switching? No. No. So you think this is still what? Which one is which, you think? This is, and this is. Oh, come on. You're overwhelmed. <laughs> I see why you left magic. <laughs> if you're interested, this Thursday night at uh, midnight on Adult Swim, you'll see me as the rabbi on Children's Hospital. Oh, really? An acting role. You might enjoy it. <laughs> That's a good segue into that plug. <laughs> yeah, I just thought I'd, uh, and people need to know these things. <laughs> it's understandable. Um, but uh, 
What, who's who's um, taking film classes here? And are you making shorts and, and so and so forth? Is it fun? <laughs> what kind of projects do you guys do now? When I was in my first video class here with uh, Mr. O'Malley, the first short film, the first thing I ever did was a sequel to Lawnmower Man. I made Lawnmower Man too. <laughs> mm. That was fine. I remember someone in my class did a key to Rebecca. They tried to adapt the whole uh, novel, a key to Rebecca, in, as a short, like five inch short. I don't know a key to Rebecca. <laughs> oh, it was I, like I, some like novel. I never, I don't even know what it is either. But it was like this very thick novel that was <laughs> like a like a pol Ken Follett like you know airplane novel. And he's like, I could do this in five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. So what kind of stuff are you doing? Somebody say it. Who's making, somebody raise your hand who's making a short right now. What's it about? <laughs> um, uh, well, um, <laughs> uh, well I, right now I'm making a short film about um, the story of like two girls in a relationship as it changes over the years and um, uh, short drama. It's like a new world for me. Um, and it's, I'm finishing up soon. Have you shot it already? Yeah. And what was, what did you, what was, what was hard about the shooter? What was surprising? What didn't work out the way you hoped? Um, well, I, I sort of discovered that it takes a lot of preparation ahead of time to make it work perfectly, because something always goes wrong. Like I was going to destroy my camera fell into a water fountain. <laughs> always got a plan for that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a common thing. <laughs> so um, just making sure you have all your bases covered. We have water fountain insurance on all my productions. <laughs> 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 What kind of cameras do you guys use here at the school now? Uh, seven, oh, these, the 70s and 50s. Remember, we, we had a... We I, had know, a I know you use very bright lights. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we had a VHS camera and an SVHS camera, but you, right. had your work, you had to work your way up to the SVHS camera. We had the camera. pneumatic three-quarter inch machine. I'm oh, 10 uh, years older than you. Nice. It was, yeah. I was, the, I was the president of the video productions club at Shaker Heights High School. Um, and it's only number. You wear a lot of different hats with acting, producing, writing, and directing. Is there anything that you, uh, what's your favorite, or do they all support each other? And what is it like when you're acting and directing yourself? Um, I do think they're all, for me, the way I do it, they're definitely all parts of the same whole. I don't think of, um, I don't think of them as so separate. They're all just serving different parts of serving the same story that's being told. Um, when I, I have done a fair amount of acting and directing at the same time, which is sort of fun in that it's so hard and so crazy. And, um, but I, and sometimes I do better performance when I'm directing because I'm not thinking so much about my acting. And it helps me be less inhibited. But um, it's very tough to do for me. And, and I, it's a lot of, you have to, have a little bit more trust in some of the people behind the camera, you know, other people, because you can't sit and watch every single take and be acting at the same time. What are you excited about for the future right now? What uh, is there another format that you want to work in, or is there a type of film there that you want to make? Kind of is. I mean, I, 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 I'm excited about the fact that things are changing so often, and that there were the feature film as it is is not. I just think that the feature film's place in our larger <coughs> landscape is changing and I think obviously the TV world is completely in transition and the web and everything. I just would you want to do a film for the Netflix model? Yeah, I think I is would. It's like House of Cards where you know, they release all the movies that can, you know, all the episodes yeah, in one day. I would love to do a Netflix-y kind of thing. I have a few things that I'm working on that are in that mold mm -hmm. and I'm always excited about like the new, the new models and both from the business side and the production side and um, I just think it's, and I'm always looking to challenge myself without, without it being artificial. But I'm, you know, I'm not committed to only doing comedy, and I'm, but so far that's basically all. I've done. <laughs> well, I'm so happy that you did go into comedy because it, uh, you had a huge impact on me, both oh, getting to meet you when I was younger and uh, uh, and on me as a filmmaker and a storyteller. So and thank you very much. Congratulations to you on all the Oscars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of which I've yet to win one. Well. <laughs> I'm getting nominated is very good. It is, it's nice. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for coming out tonight. How about a round of applause for David Ray? Thank you very much.